Please open your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Old Testament. This book is the last book in a collection known as the Pentateuch, a series of five books written by Moses which open the Old Testament. These books take us through a lot of important history. They begin at the very beginning of history itself, with God creating the heavens and the earth and making mankind in His own image. There, we learn that humanity was made to have dominion over a good world in which we were to reflect God's character and likeness as His image bearers while we walked in fellowship with Him. But then humanity soon fell from this glorious place. When our first parents, Adam and Eve, committed humanity's first sin in the Garden of Eden. God then came and judged Adam and Eve and cast them out of Eden and out of His presence. From there, the widespread result of that first sin was quickly seen as humanity multiplied and the world became full of violence and evil and death. God's heart was grieved and He proceeded to judge the world through a flood destroying all life on the face of the earth, except for Noah and his family, who found favor in God's sight. So the world, in a sense, now had a fresh start. But even after a judgment that was so drastic as the flood, we, we soon see that the corruption of sin in the world and in the heart of mankind is not washed away. And that a greater remedy would be required to deal with this great problem. And so from there, the story focused our attention on a man named Abraham, to whom God made a promise that through him, through his seed or through his offspring, all nations would be blessed. Abraham then went on to have a son in his old age, born of God's promise, a son named Isaac, who then went on to have descendants who would become known as the children of Israel who, as the book of Genesis closes, find themselves living in Egypt after being saved from a famine. That sets the stage for the book of Exodus, which 400 years later finds the family of Abraham in bondage in Egypt where they were now slaves. God delivered the family of Abraham from this slavery and showed his might over Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt through a series of ten plagues and through a mighty act of deliverance at the Red Sea where the waters of the sea were parted for Israel to pass through safely on dry ground and where the armies of Egypt were destroyed as they pursued God's people and God caused that water to come crashing down on top of them. And there on the other side of that water, is where we find the first song of praise to God in Scripture, a song that is offered to Him after a great act of salvation and deliverance. God then brought His people to the foot of Mount Sinai where He gave Moses the Ten Commandments along with the terms of the covenant and the blueprint for a special tent called the tabernacle where God's presence would once again dwell in the midst of His people. Exodus then ended with that tabernacle being constructed and set up and with the cloud of God's presence descending upon it. From there, God instructed Israel through Moses on how they were to live in His holy presence as His holy people and how to approach Him in worship in the book of Leviticus. The book of Numbers picked up the story from there telling about how Israel set out from the foot of Mount Sinai to begin their journey to the promised land that how they had sent a group of spies into the land to spy out the land, but when they came back, they discouraged the people with news that while the land was a good land, just as God had told them, it was inhabited by formidable enemies who were living in fortified cities that they did not think that they would be able to overcome. They were certain they couldn't. And so the people rebelled against the Lord. They refused to believe that the God who had just saved them from slavery in Egypt and who had just showed His great power over Pharaoh and his army would continue to keep them, would continue to go before them and would fight for them. They wanted to appoint a new leader who would take them back to Egypt. They accused God of only bringing them up out of Egypt to kill them in the wilderness and to make their children a prey 
They even suggest it would have been better to die in Egypt, and even in the wilderness, than to go up into this land where God was taking them. And so the Lord responded to this rebellion and to their unbelief by telling them that he would essentially give them what they wanted, that since they didn't want to go up into the land, they wouldn't. And since they thought it would be better to die in the wilderness, that's exactly what would happen. That entire generation that came up out of Egypt in the Exodus would not enter into God's promised rest, but would die in the wilderness over the next 40 years. However, their children, whom they thought would become a prey in the land, they would enter God's promise and experience the goodness of the land. And this brings us to the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth and final book of Moses. The title of the book means Second Law, a name that it gets from the fact that Moses, who knows that his time on earth is coming to a close, is now seeking to call this new generation of Israelites to covenant faithfulness before God, unlike their rebellious parents. And so he proceeds to give them a series of speeches, or sermons, if you will, in which he recounts the law and, inst and, the, and the instruction that God had given him and applies it to their lives. And in this book and in these speeches, he continuously reminds them both of their former rebellion as well as God's faithfulness as he urges them to trust in the Lord. The book begins by retelling some of their history, opening in chapter 1 with Israel's refusal to enter into the land in the previous generation. Moses declared in verses 29 to 32 of chapter 1, saying, Then I said to you, do not be in dread or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness where you have seen how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place, Yet in spite of this, you did not believe the Lord your God. Moses put his finger here on the heart of the problem. It wasn't that the Lord hadn't given Israel enough reasons to trust him. It was really just the opposite. He carried them the way that a father would tenderly carry a small child. He gave them every reason to trust him. And yet in spite of all the things that they had seen, they wouldn't, they, they couldn't trust the Lord. So Moses then went on to recount the penalty as the previous generation ended up wandering and dying in the wilderness. But even there, God's faithfulness was seen. As Moses declares in chapter 2, verse 7, saying, For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands, he knows you're going through the, this great wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. He's been with you. And you've lacked nothing. Even in the face of a rebellious people who stubbornly refused to trust Him, God didn't abandon them or utterly forsake them. He took care of them all the way. Moses then recounted how kings rose up against Israel, King Sihon and King Og, and how the Lord delivered these kings into their hands, giving His people the victory over them. And from there, He reminds them in chapter 3, verses 21 and 22, Your eyes have seen all that the Lord your God has done to these two kings so will the Lord do to all the kingdoms into which you're crossing. You shall not fear them, for it is the Lord your God who fights for you. In chapter 4, Moses further explains that the call of Israel to follow God in obedience to God's commandments, it had a much bigger purpose in the world. 
This chosen people being led by God through the wilderness and into this promised land, this people who was instructed in His ways and, and was to walk in them, was meant to serve as a witness to the nations. In verses 5 through 8 of chapter 4, Moses said, See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them in the land that you were entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. Who when they hear all these statutes that the Lord taught you, they will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call on Him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? This plea for Moses is so important for us to see because we tend to look at the Old Testament and think that God gave the people the law in order to earn their salvation and to earn the right to become His people. But the first five books of Moses tell the story of God calling and delivering a people that He then brings to Himself and then instructs His delivered people that are His in His ways. So first He saves them by, by His grace, and then He calls them to live faithful and holy lives so that they can shine as lights and, uh, to the nations, as His witnesses, so that a lost and broken world can see the wisdom and goodness of God through His people. Moses then recounted the Ten Commandments in chapter 5. And then in chapter 6, verses 4, 4 to 7, he gave them what is known as the Shema, which includes the greatest commandment according to Jesus, saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and you shall talk of them when you sit down in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You see, it wasn't that God gave the law to Israel so that they could earn salvation. He had already saved them for Himself and then taught them His ways so that they could reflect Him in the world. They were called to love the Lord who had saved them with all their heart and soul and mind and strength. And then it may be one of the most beautiful passages in this book. In chapter 7, Moses explained to the people why it is that God chose them. In verses 6 to 8, he said, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for His treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set His love on you and chose you. For the, you were the fewest of all people. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that He swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So why did the Lord choose Israel? Why did He make them His treasured possession? Was it because they earned it by their own righteousness or by their own strength? No. They were loved by God because God chose to love them. This is why they were saved and brought near to God. Because He loved them. The reason He loved them is because He loved them. And in response to this, they were then called to trust Him and be faithful to the one that loved them. And yet in spite of all that He had done for them, they struggled to trust Him and love Him in return. So Moses further explains in chapter 9 that the reason 
They were going in to possess the land and why their enemies would be driven out before them. It wasn't because of their righteousness. It was rather because God was going to drive out the wicked nations for their own sin, not because of Israel's righteousness. And then seemingly to emphasize this point that it wasn't because of their righteousness, Moses then recounted the story of Israel's rebellion at the foot of Mount Sinai where they worshipped a golden calf, praising it as the one that brought them up out of Egypt while the cloud of God's presence was right in front of them on top of Mount Sinai. Moses keeps his finger on the heart of the problem and points to their real need in chapter 10, verses 14 to 16, where he says, Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them, you above all the peoples, as you are this day. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. Do you hear what Moses is saying? God had saved them by His grace, according to His promise, and had set them free from their slavery and was bringing them into the promised land, not because they were strong or righteous. They were weak and helpless without Him. He was doing this because He loved them. But even though they had been saved and brought near the Lord, witnessing His mighty hand at work in their lives, they didn't trust Him in their hearts and kept wanting to turn back from following Him. Their hearts were uncircumcised. Their hearts needed to be changed. So from here, after having recounted some of their history and their rebellion in the face of God's faithfulness, and after calling them to respond to God's grace by trusting Him, for, uh, trusting him from their hearts and following Him in faithfulness, Moses spends the next several chapters presenting Israel with a detailed retelling of the law, instructing a new generation of Israelites in God's will and in God's ways, explaining and expanding upon the Ten Commandments as he continues his urgent call to covenant faithfulness. Throughout these chapters, detailing the law Israel was to follow, we get to see different ways that Israel was called not only to reflect God's righteous character, but also His grace and kindness. We see this in a variety of different laws. In chapter 14, as Israel is being instructed about tithing, for instance, they're not only told to bring a tenth of all their crop before the Lord year by year, but then they're also told in verse 28 and 29 that at the end of Every three years, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in the same year and lay it up within your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the sojourner and the fatherless and the widow who are within your towns shall come and eat and be filled. That, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the, works, uh, the work of your hands that you do. So they were not only to bring a tenth of their yield every year to the Lord, but Every third year, they were to bring a tenth in order to show compassion and grace to the stranger and to the orphan and to the widow, passing on to others the same grace that they had received from the Lord in their weakness and in their need. They were also instructed about justice. They were instructed about appointing judges in the land who would judge justly, who would defend the abused and the oppressed without being blinded by money or perverting justice for the highest bidder, but to reflect God's righteous character in the midst of His people so that God's righteous character would be reflected in His people. There are also laws that were not so much about immorality per se and unrighteousness as they were about looking out for the well-being of others, such as in chapter 22, verse 8, where we read, When you build a new house, you shall make a parapet for your roof, that you may not bring the guilt of blood upon your house, if anyone should fall from it. Now, essentially, this law is a building code that seeks to protect people by calling for some type of railing or wall around the roof of a house, which would also have been used as a deck 
in order to keep people from accidentally falling over and getting seriously injured. Which means that God's people are called to be a caring people that are concerned for the safety and the well-being of others. Now, of course, there are many more laws in Deuteronomy. Laws about cities of refuge, laws about witnesses, laws about unsolved murders, laws about sexual immorality, laws about uncleanness, and, and so on. But after retelling and explaining the law to a new generation of Israelites, Moses instructs the people in chapters 27 that when they've crossed over the Jordan, some of the tribes were to stand on Mount Gerizim and bless the people while the other tribe stood on Mount Ebal for the curse. And then in chapter 28, Moses gives a long list of blessings that the Lord would bring upon the people for their obedience, followed by an even longer list of curses that the Lord would bring upon them for their disobedience. These curses would result in a series of very serious judgments as punishments for their sin, which would include them being scattered throughout the nations. These curses are difficult to read, but they're an important part of the story to understand when it comes to our salvation, as we'll soon see. But for now, Moses continues to keep his finger on the heart of the problem as the covenant is renewed in chapter 29, where he says in verses 2 through 4, you have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, the great trials that your eyes saw, the signs and those great wonders. But to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. Moses knew that while they had experienced God's grace and had witnessed His faithfulness in their lives, while they had been given every reason to trust Him, they still didn't have eyes to see or a heart to understand. The heart of the problem was still there, which of course is the problem of the heart, the fallen and sinful heart of man. And so Moses lets the people know that they're going to fail. Yes, they're going to follow Joshua across the Jordan and enter into the promised land. And yes, they're going to experience the Lord's faithfulness and His blessings as He goes before them and delivers their enemies into their hands and establishes them in the land, fulfilling His word. But ultimately, the people are going to fail. And so in chapter 30, Moses tells the people in verses 1 to 3 that when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and you return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey His voice and all that I have commanded you today with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. He will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. And then in verse 6, he says, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the hearts of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Moses then declared from here that he's setting life and death before the people and urges them to choose life rather than death. And after this, knowing that his time on earth was drawing to a close, he appoints Joshua as successor and then writes the word of this law and gives it to the priest. And then the Lord said to Moses in chapter 31, verses 16 to 20, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers. Then this people will rise and whore after the foreign gods among them in the land that they are entering. And they will forsake me and break my covenant that I have made with them. And then in my anger I will, in my anger, sorry, then my anger will be kindled against them in that day and I will forsake them and hide my face from them. And they will be devoured and many evils and troubles will come upon them so that they will say in that day, have not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us. 
And I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil that they have done because they have turned to other gods. Now therefore write this song to be a witness for me against the people of Israel. For when I have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to give their fathers, and they have eaten and are full and grown fat, they will turn to other gods and serve them. And they will despise me and break my covenant. So at the end of chapter 31 and through chapter 32, Moses writes a song. A song that bears witness to the justice and faithfulness of God and a song that bears witness to the corruption and unfaithfulness of His people. He taught it to them. To sing it. To pass it on to their children as a witness from God against them. After this, Moses climbs up a mountain where he then saw the promised land from afar, and then Moses died there, and the Lord buried him. So the book ends with the people of Israel ready to enter into the land under the new leadership of Joshua, after being reminded by Moses of their past rebellion in the face of God's faithfulness, and after being told that they would fail in the future, and that their ultimate need was for God to circumcise their hearts so that they could love Him, so that they could trust the One who loved them and delivered them. So how do we see Jesus? And how do we see the Gospel in Deuteronomy? Well, I want you to see that Israel wasn't saved by keeping the law. I want you to see that Israel didn't earn the right to be delivered and made God's people by their obedience to His rules and, and commandments. God had delivered Israel because He loved them. And He loved them not because they were righteous or strong, but because He chose to love them. It was out of that love that they were brought out from bondage in Egypt and brought to the Lord Himself, fulfilling His promise to Abraham. It was to a delivered people that God instructed in His ways so that they could be a witness to the world about the goodness of God as they loved and followed Him. But they were not able to love Him from the heart. They were not able to trust Him from the heart or follow Him in a sincere faith, motivated by love because of their stubborn and uncircumcised hearts, because of sin's effect on the heart that, that leaves us in rebellion against our Maker, that leaves us distrusting Him even when He's working for a good right in front of our eyes. We question His good intentions. We're unable to trust Him and we choose our own way rather than His. I want you to see that by the time we've reached the end of the law in the Pentateuch, we can already see that the law isn't the answer to our sin problem. We're at the end of the books of Moses. And even Moses sees God's got to change these people's hearts. They can't do it. They're not going to do it. It wasn't that Israel needed better laws and rules. They needed a divine transformation on the inside. Which means that the law wasn't given as a way of salvation. The law was given to emphasize our need for it. Now, similarly to Deuteronomy, the gospel does not call us to earn salvation by our obedience God comes to us while we're still dead in our trespasses and sins and brings us to Himself in salvation, raising us from out of death into new spiritual life in Jesus Christ. Then He instructs us in His ways and calls us to follow Him in faithfulness after having given us every reason to trust Him. But in the Gospel, the work of salvation Jesus accomplished is applied to our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit, giving us a heart to understand giving us eyes to see and ears to hear, enabling us to respond to God's grace by loving and trusting the one who loved us first. This results in believers desiring from the heart to know God and to walk in His ways rather than our own. It causes us to desire to reflect His love in the world and shine as lights as His witnesses so that others can come to see and hear and understand and trust and love this good God that we have come to know in Jesus Christ. 
in Christ, we can also know that our future is secure. Where in Deuteronomy, they were told they would fail and reap the curses of their disobedience in Christ. We're told that God will finish the good work He started. Not because we perfectly keep the law, but because He has perfectly ac accomplished our salvation and will perfectly keep us just as He has said. As we trust in Him, we're met with His forgiveness when we fail. And we're enabled by the Spirit to walk in obedience and reflect God's character in our lives, showing that we've been, we've been made right with God and we've been changed by Him as a gift of His grace. Even after giving the law, Moses knew Israel would ultimately fail. And even as he explained the blessings for obedience and the curses for disobedience, he knew they wouldn't be able to live up to the law's demands. And they would fall under its curse. But even in these things, Deuteronomy helps prepare us for Christ and for the gospel. As the Lord told Moses, he would raise up a prophet like him from among the people. A promise that pointed forward to Christ, who would one day take all the curses for our disobedience upon himself at the cross. so that He could bless us with all the blessings for His obedience in His perfect and sinless life. This is a great exchange where we are given His righteousness and He has taken our sin upon Himself and paid our debt at the cross. We get His blessings. He took our curse. An exchange at Deuteronomy helps us understand and treasure as our only hope. And Christ, as this prophet like Moses to come, would be a much better lawgiver than Moses as well, for it's been rightly observed that while Moses could only give the people a law written on tablets of stone, leaving their hearts unchanged, Christ is able to write His law on the tablets of our hearts, which He circumcises and delivers from a deeper bondage, from our slavery to sin, enabling us to love the One who first loved us and to follow the One who saved us with joy and with faith. Which means that Deuteronomy is ultimately pointing us to Jesus Christ and preparing us for the gospel. Let's pray.